India and Africa have an important role in uh, global food security to ensure that we all have enough to eat in future, especially amid the uh, rapid rise in the global population rate. Now, while both countries are abundant in natural food resources, food insecurity has been a major issue and made worse by the COVID-19 pandemic, as everyone is aware at this stage. However, numerous opportunities do exist for collaboration between India and Africa in food processing and as well agriculture. So this panel will explore those opportunities and the kind of seeds that need to be planted today to reap a more nutritious uh, rate of economic growth with fewer people going to bed unfed or underfed tomorrow. Before we get into it, let me introduce you to the panelists. Rajnikant Rai, Chief Executive at the ITC's Agri Business Division. Dr. Langa Simela, Business Development Manager at APSA Agribusiness. Ayodeji Balogun, Chief Executive Officer at Apex Commodities. The moderator is CNBC Africa anchor Fifi Peters. Well, I'd like to welcome all the panelists uh, to the Indo-Africa Summit and, uh, of course, extend my good afternoon to you all. And thank you for the time that you have given us to discuss a very, very important uh, subject for the continent. And if we can get straight to it, because uh, already existing partnerships uh, do um, are, are present between India and Africa in this space. But by way of introduction, and uh, Rajni Kant, if I can just come to you, uh, regarding these existing partnerships that we have seen so far on the continent, how have they been impacted? By, by the pandemic and uh, presently as we have this discussion three months into the new year um, how is the road to recovery looking like yeah <clears throat> good afternoon uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, organizing the so lovely uh, program which is India and Africa is specific uh, I'd like to mention that, uh, you know, that India and Africa is working uh, since long uh, together in the agriculture area. But uh, during the pandemic, the biggest challenges has been the movement of uh, goods and services between both the countries, as well as uh, innovation in the new field. Because of the physical movements of the people has been restricted. And that has been a challenge during this period. But those few points I'd like to highlight uh, our relationship uh, in multiple areas between India and uh, Africa. Uh, primarily, uh, last 10 years, we have seen that a lot many companies have gone and invested into lands, whether on lease or as well as the owning the land for long duration for doing the farming. So that has been uh, last 10 years, some progress has happened, but lately, Due to some uh, policies issues, uh, the growth of in that area has been limited. And the also returns for those people who have invested have not seen that kind of uh, expectation what they had at the time of taking over the responsibility. I believe that uh, few challenges which uh, needs to be overcome uh, between both the countries. One uh, critical challenge is that the technology uh, related to agriculture and food processing have to uh, have to uh, have to transfer to African countries and get adopted as a faster pace. And for that, I think a uh, lot of supports required from the uh, government side of African countries, and that is very very critical. Another part, what we believe is uh, land holding is like in India; it's uh, not a large farmers we have in Africa. We have large arable lands, but uh, it's a very uh, thinly spread. So therefore the practices and the uh, kind of technology is relevant what India have today for African countries as well. So I believe that uh, it will be perfect match if you are able to collaborate and transfer easily the technology and the practices between both the countries. Uh, that is one area I believe and uh, I believe that uh, India has already advanced many ways of uh, seed production, hybrid seed production, uh, IT platforms uh, uh, like drone uses and the kind of mechanization in agriculture. If uh, this can be built uh, smoothly between the, both the countries and uh, seamlessly can flow from each other, 
that will help a long way to build uh, our relationship. So going forward, uh, uh, after listening from other panelists, I can give my specific comments. These are the few points I thought I will highlight here. No, definitely. Thank and you. We'll, uh, thank you, sir. And we will be exploring a lot of your uh, comments as we continue with the discussion. But as we uh, continue uh, at our opening remarks, uh, Dr. Langa, I'd like to bring you in uh, perhaps to give the African perspective. Because in the past 12 months from a South African point of view, what we did, of course, see is our um, a land bank, a key institution that supports farming and agriculture here in South Africa, getting into trouble. It defaulted on some key important debt payments and that spells all sorts of uh, repercussions uh, for the the, uh, the farmers and the various players within the agricultural sector that, that it supports. But if we speak holistically about the subject here today, in your view, as you reflect on the present challenges, mm. what are the low-hanging fruits that are in need of critical uh, attention for us to change the direction in which food insecurity is going presently? Um, thank you, Fifi. I think for me, the low hanging fruits that we have first are the resources that we have at our disposal. I mean, we say the continent has 60% of the world's uncultivated land, that's an odd 200,000 hectares or more. And we're still predominantly fairly low productivity compared to, to the rest of the world. Uh, if you just compare our cereals, for instance, to India, India is 3.4 tons per hectare average cereal yield, whereas ours is, is 1.5. Uh, so we, we have a long way to go. But what I, I like about what is happening on the African continent is that we have this comprehensive Africa development program. Yes, it's been going on for 18 years and probably made slow progress. But of late, if you, you would have seen, they've started a biennial review of the progress that the countries are, make, are making in the commitments that they made you know, to it in line with the kind of framework. And in the latest review, only four countries actually sort of met their targets of where they should be in terms of progress. But what is what I like about that is we have a way of measuring progress. So mm -hmm. we can analyze where we are, decide where the interventions are and hopefully step up. I think Africa realizes, you know, that we've got to use the resources at our disposal as efficiently as possible. We have a target to end hunger by 2025. And, and that's what, uh, three years down the line. So we have to step up progress, do the investments that we talk about into agriculture, into agricultural technologies, improve rural infrastructure and trade, and up our production and productivity so that we, we meet our targets. I feel that there is a really greater sense of commitment to those targets, perhaps, than we had before. And I say that, if I may, if you just add, just looking at us as well as South Africa, I mean, for the longest of time, we've been sort of trying to plan our agriculture and where we're going with it. We have the National Development Plan that was developed, I think, 2011, 12. But now we're actually doing this agriculture master plan, agriculture and agro-processing master plan, and this commitment from across all spheres of government to, to make sure that we have these plans and bring in industry and we're all committed to support them. So I, I'm, I'm a positive person and I'm always believe that there is positivity and if we all commit to what we're going to do we'll make progress uh, i'll stop there for now fifi uh, the commitment is encouraging but of course as you do say i mean uh, some of the plans already on the table have been taking place or have been progressing too slowly and uh, we'll un unpack and explore the degree to which these can be accelerated but if i bring my uh, last speaker ayodeji um, into this and uh, if you can just also uh, paint a bit of color from a commodity commodities perspective because uh, what we have seen is a, a an increase um, in in many commodity prices of the past uh, year for all sorts of reasons and I'm just wondering to what degree this is uh, beneficial perhaps for the farmer uh, maybe not so much for us uh, consumers who have to pay higher prices for food but to what degree are you finding it beneficial for the farmer in uh, playing a bigger role in the uh, food security value chain and perhaps also helping to off offset some of the other input costs to farming that have been increasing and therefore further down the line, I'm not having to pass uh, the higher, uh, much higher costs onto the consumer. Thank you very much, Fifi. Um, it's, it's an interesting point, but I think, you know, just as a student of economics, um, inflation is not good for anybody in the long run. Mm. It's, it erodes wealth in the long run. So whether the farmer or the consumer, you know, is just not where we want. But it's understandable that we are in that point where we need a tension between do we solve for growth or do we solve for 
inflation. Um, and I think most uh, African continents are that most uh, parts of the world actually are on an expansionary stance uh, from the monetary standpoint where they would rather uh, finance growth um, and get out of recessions where they do have recessions um, at the expense of inflation. Now, yes, that's had some very good short-term effects on, um, on, on, on farmers. In Nigeria, farmers' income from an average commodity this year has been as higher than last year's income, about 60% which is good uh, uh, for their income and their capacity. But if you also look at it and look at global fertilizer prices uh, uh, in the last two, three months also, they've also gone up by 25 to 30% uh, just by the sort of resets in the supply chains coming after COVID. Uh, so it is, it is a, a, a bit of a complicated uh, scenario where you have production prices also going up, consumption prices also going up, and then inflation going up. Uh, at, at the food baskets being the driver of inflation growth. Mm -hmm. So if we um, had to chart our way and plan our way uh, post the disruptions of COVID-19, how should we be going about doing it? Uh, Raj, uh, Rajnikant, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the all-important issue of technology at, in your opening remarks and uh, the degree to which this can help us uh, leapfrog or perhaps uh, close the gap in terms of our, development, our developmental challenges. But how, how do you see uh, the synergies between the, um, the Indian and, 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 and governments here in Africa in exploring uh, those uh, technologies to help us capacitate both agricultural sectors? Yeah, I think, uh, as rightly mentioned, the last couple of, last, last one year, actually, the inflation has been the concern for the uh, many countries, uh, including India, for the food basket. And India, actually, lately, it has started going up. Otherwise, it has been reasonably below 5% kind of inflation in the country which has been the last four or five years has been within the three to four by five percent kind of range, which was very well accepted. But that has come at the cost of uh, kind of development, uh, GDP growth, because the challenges was that the farmers were not realizing the better price uh, because of the low inflation as well as the plenty production. Now, India is a surplus country as far as the food is concerned. We have almost uh, all cereals, vegetables, milk, you name the products which goes into the food basket, India have a surplus today. The challenge of India is how to consume this surplus. If you are going to distribute uh, cheaper or free to the poorer families, then the farmer will suffer in long run because overall price is very, very uh, low. Our realization is going to be low because there is a lot of large population is getting fed at uh, almost at a discounted price of the free cost. So I think for between Africa and India, there can be a joint working group of food processing and production planning, where both the countries can work together considering the total demand as Africa and India wow. of a food basket, and considering both the both type of farmers having the same kind of challenges, whether it is uh, investment capacity or the land holding. So technology can perfectly fit into both of us, uh, whatever we develop. The joint research group can be built, who can uh, develop the specific variety and seeds. And the technology which can be used in India can be easily replicated in Africa, whether it's in irrigation or whether it's the farming practices, whether it is the farming technology. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a lot can be done between both of us, both the African countries and India. But one thing we need to definitely work together is kind of the, the consumption, food consumption basket we can see together as a two uh, continent, basically I can say that way, and see that what kind of uh, food uh, surplus in one part of the uh, country and another part deficit, how we can balance it out and build a value chain which will be very cost effective. Today in Africa, supply chain cost is very, very high even higher than India. India itself is higher than the world, other European countries. But Africa is also almost 20% much higher, uh, higher than the India. So I think we need to work together for production planning, consumption strategy, processing plan, as well as technology implementation. Also, a lot of new innovation happening in food processing as well as agriculture area. India have today at minimum 1,000 startups who are working in the agri uh, technology front which is going to help farmer in long run for uh, production planning, for the yield improvements, certification of their produce, and the uh, better processing uh, output of those uh, crops. 
So I think we need much closer relationship than a principal to principal. Actually, the partnership approach requires, so I think that is missing today. Right. We doesn't work as a partner. We work as a principal to principal to each other. Uh, it's like a transactional relationship. I think we have to move because government to government, they are working well, but the private sectors are the industries. We have to collaborate much better way as a partners, considering both the country's strength and weaknesses and try to address it as a holistic in a holistic manner. And mm -hmm. I believe that is a long way to uh, create a sustainable kind of uh, business models for both the countries. Okay. These are my few observations. Uh, and right. I think... Uh, the, and guide yeah. and suggest. No, certainly, and I heard one of the panelists, uh, Dr. Langa, uh, agreeing with a lot of the points that you were uh, that you had put forward. And Dr. Langa, perhaps to get uh, some comments uh, from you here as well, as I do believe you want to add to uh, what our previous speaker uh, Rajnikad had said. But also, can you address the issue of the financing gap? You know, as a as a financier mm -hmm. coming from the, the the banking sector, a lot mm -hmm. of realizing the potential of both uh, agricultural sectors in both countries is going to need a lot of money and how do we get that money to feel comfortable to invest in 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 this space thanks once again Fifi. yes i totally agree with what with uh, mr rai what you said i always say we say africa is a an sme country or continent rather and i think it's the same with india especially indian agriculture but i find we really have very little focus or, or, or on developing the SMEs in production and agro-processing and across the value chain. Uh, we seem not to have mastered that art. And for me, I think that's one area of collaboration that um, Africa and India can focus on and how do we use these resources that we have and use them efe efficiently, how to achieve aggregation at production, processing and, and, and throughout the, the value chain. And secondly, in terms of, of trade, um, the continent and India have a comparative advantage in different areas. For instance, India produces rice, wheat, vegetables, oils, which we don't really are not very good at on the continent. Meanwhile, and coming from South Africa, I'll talk of our beef, horticulture and wine. So I think we should have trade agreements that allow us to trade with uh, products that we have comparative advantage on. And then coming to financing. Um, the biggest problem, of course, is, is the, the risk sharing that happens in that space. Um, most of it's, it's been alluded to, we have unsecured land tenure in most of our countries and, and, and issues like that. So we really should look at risk sharing models that we can implement. And I must say again, here in South Africa, we are working on that with government, with producer organizations. We're working what we call blended finance model, where we can bring in finance from the private sector, bring in um, grant funding from government and development funding from other institutions. And that will enable us to finance our smallholder sector, which, you know, for the longest time, we've not been able to do so efficiently. Yeah, uh, because, I mean, um, the issue of, uh, particularly here in South Africa, having uh, watched the debate around uh, the risk around unsecured land, land tenure, it has uh, certainly been an impediment to crowding in further investments. And I'm just wondering, um, Ayodeji, as you come in here, you know, giving us the perspective of, of a private player, uh, we had heard from the other speaker to say that uh, the, uh, the private uh, uh, public partnerships, uh, particularly from a private sector point of view, have, have not been as strong as they could be. And I'm just wondering to what degree uh, policy issues like um, the risk associated with not having full ownership of the land or uh, policy uh, changes is impacting on the, uh, the, the willingness of the private sector to put more money onto the table. And uh, perhaps any suggestions or solutions in your view uh, that could further crowd in private sector investments? Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, definitely um, policy inconsistency is always a big risk to any investor. You ideally want to have a consistent terrain because it takes time to build businesses, gain traction, gain market share, and then start to get returns, especially when we are looking at FDI money and not just uh, hot money that comes in onto the capital market or the money market and is exiting. Uh, what we've seen in Nigeria is a situation where uh, we, Nigeria, does have a risk share facility uh, managed by the central bank's uh, entity, and that provides some comfort. It shares up to 75% of risk for smallholder farmers, but also 
about 50% for more commercial based transactions. And uh, this has increased uh, uh, the, the share of lending to the private sector, but it's still, it's still a huge gap. Uh, we've seen today credit has grown from about 3.5% about five, six years ago of share of total credits uh, to the private sector uh, to about 5% going to, into agriculture. Uh, but then that is, if you look at this quantum of capital, uh, it's just barely 2% of the size of the agricultural sector. So extremely too small to finance uh, the sector in a competitive way and in a way that actually leads to job creation and um, great export earnings. Now, when we think of how to solve it, uh, one of the things that we do as a commodities exchange is to ensure securitization. So 24% uh, of Nigeria's GDP and indeed close to 30% of Africa's GDP are in commodities in bags, agricultural commodities in bags, from cocoa to coffee to cashew to maize, rice, and other commodities. Uh, if we do have a way where we can indeed securitize these commodities, make them listed, uh, manage the price risk, then you could free up huge capital. Africa has a growing and one of the larger, fastest growing pension funds um, in, the, in, the, in, in the world, actually. So uh, this is a huge, tremendous capital pool that can indeed finance this, but then we need to secure securitization. We need to increase competitiveness of our producers. We also need to bring in the right talents to manage our agricultural sector. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And uh, so far, uh, the panel has been very generous in uh, sharing the, the insights and solutions into exactly how we can um, improve the areas of agriculture and food processing between India and Africa. And we've, spoke, we've spoken quite a bit about the role that technology can play um, in ramping up the quality of production, the quantity of production, um, the uh, credit gap. Uh, we've spoken about the uh, things that need to happen to ensure that some more uh, financing can potentially be released. And one of them, of course, being the securitization of the land. And um, also the importance of increasing competitiveness. But I believe that right now the focus has actually uh, largely been on COVID-19 um, as a result of me steering the conversation in that way. But there are other impediments in the agricultural space that we, 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 we both face by way of climate change, for instance, by way of um, an issue re regarding pests. Uh, in, in many African countries now, there's the issue around locusts as well, as well as the issue of, of conflict in many areas that eats into agricultural outputs and um, is the result of a lot of people going to bed underfed. I'd like to understand as we wrap up this, this discussion, the panel's view on how to address those challenges. Uh, what can be done? And uh, once again, Ranjini Katz, if you can lead us there. Yeah. So you'd like to share some uh, examples from Indian context point of view when you were talking about the sustainability in agriculture uh, sector. Primary environmental issues are becoming more and more challenging, and it is going to affect maximum agriculture first and then other things later. So what we believe is that uh, sustainable agriculture practices is going to be long-term sustainable way of uh, delivering value to the agriculture sector and therefore farmers. And uh, if you have a smaller land holding and the challenge what you have a yield today in the African kind of scenario, I think one uh, strategic intent should be uh, uh, there in the African market to grow organically uh, certified products or uh, kind of integrated pest management kind of products, which is going to be better value realization and very sustainable approach for the long-term agriculture. Uh, because it's small farming, it can be monitored, it can be controlled by individual farmers, and it can actually have a very uh, region-specific, uh, unique proposition as far as European market and US market is concerned. Africa is a closer to that market, and that can if build the whole agriculture ecosystem, which is an organic platform and best practices related to uh, pesticide management, avoiding child labors, this kind of scenario, certification, whether it's a rainforest certification, I, I think these are the area which is going to give uh, much better boost to the African agriculture because becoming a global competitive as far as the productivity is concerned, it will take time as because of the there's a lot of resources challenge in the African country. Therefore, they have to find out the low cost, uh, high value uh, production planning, whether it is a coffee or cocoa or even grain or any other cereals. 
and this market is growing. And also horticulture crop is going to be the future for African kind of countries where there is a, if you plant, do the plantation, and after four or five years, you start getting uh, fruits and it can be longer time without further investments. And uh, in India, I think if the government to government negotiation can happen, India can provide a lot of fruits and vegetable variety, which is high yielding and uh, high density crop and early uh, fruiting crops. So I think some kind of best practices in agriculture and change in the uh, kind of cropping pattern that will help long way. So there are a few suggestions I like to leave on the table. All right. Uh, I don't have as much idea as the people <laughs> there have, but this is what we are, what we are practicing in India also. Uh, and uh, slowly we are moving towards sustainable agriculture. Uh, Ranji Khan, I feel like you're that kind of mother who dishes you with so much food on your plate and says that, no, I haven't dished you with, with, with too much. You can eat it all up because you've given us a whole lot of solutions and a whole lot of ideas, and we thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Langa, just your input here in addressing just the entire uh, challenges affecting the, the, the value system. I mean, uh, the kind of products, perhaps from a financier point of view, that can address um, the, the issues around uh, climate change, adaption and uh, mit mitigation, for instance, and also the issues around uh, the pest controls, the kind of um, the, the products, perhaps insurance products that can be availed to the sector at, at a cost that is affordable. Thanks again, Fifi. Um, I think for me, climate change is real. I was looking it up and they say we have a, a prediction that uh, yields will decline by 50% by 2050 if we don't do anything about it. But being in South Africa, what I've realized that in response to climate change, really it's increases in efficiency that enables producers to be able to be resilient to climate change. So if you look at South Africa as a whole, we're a very low rainfall country, averaging less than 500 milliliters per annum. But our average maize yields are five tons per hectare or more, and the rest of the continent is two tons or so. So, and a lot of it is to do with efficiencies in agriculture, so efficiency in use of land, in use of water. So you find there's a practice of conservation tillage, which also then minimizes your use of fuel in, in that space. So basically, I think if we encourage use of efficiencies, then we'll also encourage climate smart production. And that's what we see. And that's, those are the sort of things that we would also look for when we are financing agriculture enterprises. You know, how, how are they engaged with the latest technologies basically to improve their efficiencies? In terms of um, pests, my take in pest and diseases, I think, is that I hope we learned a lot from response to COVID-19, because I think most of our challenge really in the continent has been the pace of response. So we need to up our responses to pests and diseases and, and, and control them before they do a lot of damage. So that, that's the pest. I mean, that's things like your locust, your fall armyworm. We need to step in there timely and, and control them before they do a lot of damage. And that's why I say, I think COVID-19 has really taught the world a lot in terms of responding to, to risks like that, like mm -hmm. pests and diseases. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. And uh, lastly, uh, Ayo Deji, just uh, your final inputs. I mean, we heard a, 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 a statistic regarding the continents. I mean, 60% uh, of the world's arable land, yet I believe we only contribute 10% to, to, to global outputs in the uh, global agricultural food chain. So how do we reverse that? I mean, what, if you were leaving us with closing, closing thoughts as to how to uh, get the industry on course to reaping its uh, potential, uh, India and Africa, of course, what would it be? So for me, Africa must indeed be able to feed itself. And indeed, um, we do have the capacity to start to feed the rest of the world uh, because of the endowed um, good land, available arable land, water availability, rainfall, and all the other things that we do have. Um, three things that we feel like uh, we need to focus on uh, simultaneously. First is to ensure that we have the right talent. Uh, the average age of the farmers in, agri in, in agriculture in Nigeria is in Africa, it's tending towards 60 years. That needs to drop by about half. Uh, we need to have more youth that are bringing in value, knowledge, and capital. The second is sustainable capital. We need to improve the allocation of capital and create an environment that brings in more private commercial capital. I think this is one of the things where the Green Revolution in India uh, differs from the Green Revolution in Africa. Uh, you know, under two decades, India was able to move from a point of food uh, uh, insecurity to a point of food self-sufficiency. Africa is 10 years into it, but we've not seen the incremental uh, uh, per capita output in food 
as we should have seen. And I think that's because we've gone a path where we expect governments to fund uh, growth and the finance the sector, as opposed to creating an environment where private capital can drive that. Uh, the third is about just productivity. We need to bring science and technology. And uh, I agree with uh, Raj, that's where we could collaborate with India. Uh, a lot of the regions in India, we do share the same ecological zones with Africa. And you could have those, uh, you know, sharing knowledge and technology and seed varieties. Africa right. must feed itself. <laughs> uh, certainly, we must uh, move from uh, a position of um, power in that sense uh, to, and, and certainly away from being reliant on food aid. Uh, quite worrying given the fact that we are so endowed with these natural resources to do um, exactly that. But it's about making the right decisions regarding policy, uh, regarding skills upliftment, uh, using technology to um, harness all, uh, all the shortfalls that we currently have in the sector, of course. And, and yeah, pulling up the socks and uh, doing what needs to be done. I'd like to thank the panelists so much for uh, their time and uh, for giving us uh, food for thought. We'll leave it there. Um, certainly agreed that a vibrant agricultural sector is absolutely important in uh, generating sustainable economic prosperity for both our countries and of course even more important in alleviating the uh, twin ailments of poverty and uh, food security.